picture this, okay? You're working on a library management system, so you're cataloging books. You decide to use a hash set implementation to store each book in the collection, ensuring that there are no duplicates in your catalog. This implementation seems straightforward, makes sense to use a hash set, but as you run your tests, you notice something odd. Some books are just mysteriously disappearing from your catalog. You do hours of debugging, and then the light bulb goes off. The issue? Your book class has a custom hash code method, which considers the book's title and the author's last name. And among the thousands of books that you have in your catalog, there are a few books that are written by different authors with the same last name and happen to have the same title. And now, there might be different books, but for your hash set, they're basically indistinguishable. Now this scenario is not just frustrating, it's a classic example of the nuances of using the set data structure in Java. In this video, I'll be sharing five common mistakes that Java developers make when they're using sets and um, how you can avoid them. Don't make these mistakes. Mistake number one, not picking the right tool for the job. Let me ask you this. Let's say you're working on some code that involves like a feature such as tracking user actions in an application, right? You wanna register everything that the user does in an application. You wanna hold on to a bunch of user action objects and you wanna avoid duplicates. And you also wanna keep track of the order in which those events happen. Let's say you write code like this, right? You have a new hash set for holding on to the unique elements and you're gonna have an array list for holding on to the order. Now, every time there is an element, you add to both the hash set for eliminating duplicates and the ordered elements for maintaining the order, right? You put the objects in the hash set to make sure that every instance is unique and you also add the instance to the array list because you need the order to be maintained. Now, what's wrong with this code? Well, this approach is a little more complex than necessary. It requires managing two separate collections. And guess what? We can do with just one. It turns out the hash set here is really a poor choice for this job. There is another set implementation that actually keeps track of the insertion order out of the box on its own. That is the linked hash set. This implementation, the linked hash set, is kind of like a hidden gem in the Java Collections framework. I've seen it overlooked so often, but it's incredibly useful for exactly this scenario. It maintains a linked list for the entries in the set, which preserves the insertion order, the order in which you're inserting these objects into your set. So here's how you could simplify this code using linked hash set. Just add things to the linked hash set. That's it. Just add the elements and linked hash set automatically keeps track of the order of insertion. However, it's also important to understand when not to use linked hash set. So for example, if your primary concern is sorting the elements based on natural order or a specific order that's defined by the competitor, not insertion order, but a different order, in that case, the tree set is a way to go. Unlike linked hash set, the tree set sorts the elements as they're added to the set based on the natural order or a provided competitor. So the first mistake in our list is don't reinvent the wheel. Use the right tool for the job. Learn about the three popular set implementations and use the right set implementation for what you want to do. Mistake number two, not implementing the required methods in your class. When you use set implementations like hash set or tree set, you're required to understand and implement specific methods that are tailored to these collections needs. If you fail to do this, it can lead to unexpected behavior, sometimes buggy behavior. So what are these methods? So for hash set, we discuss hash set relies on hash code and also relies on equals to manage its elements. Without proper implementation of hash code and equals, these methods need to be there on your custom objects, right? Without implementing them properly, hash set cannot accurately determine uniqueness and leads to duplicate entries or missing elements. Let's take an example. Consider a person class without overridden hash code and equals, right? I have a person which has a string name and an int age. Let's assume it has constructors, getters, and setters, but no hash code or equals. Now I'm creating a new hash set of people and I'm adding a new person with the name Alice 
and age 30. Now I'm creating another instance for that same person and I'm adding it to that same hash set, new person of Alice comma 30. This is supposed to be the same person, but when I run this code, it is going to add another instance because hash code and equals are not overridden, right? It might be the same object for you, but to the hash set, it treats it as a different object. So the correct approach here is to override these methods, right? You add an equals method override and a hash code method overrides. And the equals, you override the equality logic in your hash code. You write your hash code logic based on the same fields that you used in your equals, right? Pick the same fields for both. So this is essential for a hash set. Now for a tree set, it's another thing that you have to implement. Tree set sorts its elements based on the natural ordering, which requires that the element implement a comparable interface. If you want natural ordering, you have to implement comparable. If you don't implement comparable, or if you don't provide a comparator at the tree set creation time, the set implementation just cannot sort the elements because it doesn't know which instance you deem to be larger or smaller than which other instance, right? You're asking it to sort, it needs to know what is the definition of a greater element or a lesser element, right? Imagine you use a tree set for the same person class without implementing compatible. I'm gonna add this object to a tree set. Guess what happens? I get a class cast exception, right? This is because the tree set expects that whatever you pass in implements compatible. To avoid this, you should implement the compatible interface, right? Here is a person class which implements compatible and you can put whatever logic you want. Let's say, for example, we want to compare by age, right? One person is greater than the other person based on if they have a greater age. So I do integer.compare of the age fields. That's my compare to logic. And now I can add this to the tree set, right? Now the tree set can correctly sort the person objects and it's gonna be doing it based on age, right? So for hash set, always override the hash code and the equals method to define object uniqueness. And for tree set, ensure that your elements implement compatible to enable sorting. But basically the general advice is find out what methods your set implementations need and then you co-implement those methods for whatever you put into that set. Moving on to mistake number three, overlooking the impact of mutable objects in the set. When we work with sets in Java, there is one important aspect that's often overlooked, and that is the impact of using mutable objects. What are mutable objects? They're objects whose state values can be changed after they are created. Now you might ask me, well, Kaushik, isn't that true for every Java object? Any Java object's properties can be changed to have different values, perhaps via setters, but it can be changed, right? What's the big deal? Well, the big deal is if certain values are changed for instances when they are in a set. This can lead to some pretty unpredictable behavior. All right, let's see, what's the issue at hand here? When you add an object to a hash set, Right? It's hash code is computed and used to determine where to store the object internally. How does it compute the hash code? By calling the hash code method, which you should have implemented. We talked about it before. You should have implemented the hash code method by relying on values of properties of that object. Right? When you place the object in the hash set, the hash code value is used to decide where that object is stored internally. When you need to retrieve the object, the hash set computes the hash code using the same method to figure out where that instance is in the set. Now, if this instance value, when you place the object into the set, are exactly the same as the instance values when you're trying to retrieve the object from the set, everything works fine, no problem. But if you modify the object after you've inserted it into the hash set, and in a way that changes the hash code, now the set may not be able to find it anymore, even though it's still there. It's gonna try to calculate the hash code, and now it gets a different hash code because the underlying properties have changed. For example, let's say you have a hash set of book objects, and the book has a mutable title field that's a part of the hash code and equality checks, right? So I have a book which has a string title of hash code and equals which leverage the title. I had a book's hash set, and I create a new book called Java Basics, and I add that book to that hash set, right? After I add the book, I change the title of that instance. I change it to advanced Java, right? I'm modifying a mutable field which affects the hash code. And now I'm going to check if this book is contained in the hash set. 
might return false now because the hash code has changed, right? By changing the state of the object after it's added to the set, you essentially break the contract of the set, right? The set now no longer accurately reflects what it contains and it leads to bugs, it leads to unexpected behavior, all right? Fine, what should you have done? What should you do in such cases? You have two options. First, just avoid mutable fields in hash codes and equal implementations, right? When you're using a field for hash code and equals, make sure that that's a field that's not going to change, right? If you were to use mutable fields in your instance itself, try not to include those fields in the calculations of hash code and equals, right? Or just use immutable objects, right? Immutable objects are a safe bet for sets. So like once an object is created, you cannot change any of the state inside that object, right? So you're guaranteed that the hash code and equals contracts don't change, right? This ensures the integrity of the set. Right? That's the first option. Second option, if you have to make a change, be cautious about the updates, right? If you need to modify an object that's already in a set, a safer approach, just remove the object from the set, modify it, and then re-add it, right? What happens here? When you re-add it, you ensure that the hash code is recalculated and stored correctly. If I want to change the book, what do I do? I do a book start remove of book one, I set the title, and then I add it back, right? I re-add the updated object, and now the new hash code is calculated, and that's what affects where this object gets stored in the hash set this time. All right, that's mistake number three, right? Be careful when you're dealing with things that can change in the object instance that ends up being in a hash set. Mistake number four, misunderstanding the impact of set size on performance, right? This is a frequently overlooked yet fairly impactful mistake it involves not understanding how the size of a set affects its performance, particularly when it comes to two values, the initial capacity and the load factor. This is especially relevant for hash set, which is probably the most widely used set implementation in Java. All right, now what is initial capacity and what is the load factor? You see, hash set in Java is backed by a hash map implementation. When you initialize a hash set, you're specifying two values to configure how much space is allocated and how it is managed, right? The two values are initial capacity and the load factor. The initial capacity is the initial number of buckets in the hash table that is created when the hash set is created. And the load factor is a measure of how full the hash set is allowed to get before the capacity is automatically increased. Now you don't have to specify these two values. They come with defaults and usually the default values are fine. But when you have a lot of objects being stored in the set and the initial capacity is too low, the hash set will need to reallocate space and move things around. We might go, well, Kashik, that's common in most data structures. You know, out of space, the data structure kind of shifts and gets recreated. Well, the problem with hash set is every time this happens, the data structure does what's called rehashing. Basically, it needs to call the hash code method of every object instance, and it needs to figure out where the instances go all over again. It's pretty much the same as inserting all these instances into a new hash set. As more elements get added and the set size continues to grow, this rehashing process repeats each time. The number of elements exceeds the value, which is the capacity multiplied by the load factor, because the load factor indicates when it needs to readjust. So when that point happens, then it has to rehash, it has to calculate all the hash codes all over again. When you're dealing with a large hash set and you kind of have an estimate of how many elements your hash set should hold, well, initializing it with the appropriate capacity can boost performance because it kind of skips this rehashing process, right? So here I have an expected size and I know the load factor is 0.75, which is the default load factor. So I calculate the initial capacity based on this load factor. And when I'm creating a set, I pass in this initial capacity and the load factor. So I know that until that point, this set is not going to be rehashed and readjusted. We often talk about the hash set being the most performant set, but it's not magic, right? You have to keep this capacity, load factor, and rehashing in mind, especially if you're dealing with large sets, lots of elements. Moving on to mistake number five, it is neglecting the set interface's unique methods, right? So let's say you have two sets of strings, right? set A and set B. And here's what I wanna do. I wanna find out all the elements that are common in both the sets 
and replace the contents of set A with the common elements, All right? Now here's my code. Tell me if you can spot what the problem is here, All right? I have set A, which is a bunch of strings, three fruits. I've set B, which is another three fruits, right? String sets. I have a common element, which is a new hash set. Now I'm gonna loop through set A and check if that element is contained in set B, right? If it's contained in set B, I'm going to add it to this intermediate common elements set. Once it's all done, I'm gonna clear set A and I'm going to add all the common elements to set A. Now suppose you're reviewing my code change, right? You're reviewing this change. What feedback would you give me? You might have got this right. The feedback is, don't do this stuff. Just one line of code and you can accomplish the same thing. What is that line of code? Set A dot retain all of set B. This method is not only more concise, but also more readable. It makes your intent clear to anyone who reads your code, right? In Java, each collection type has its own quirks, its own special abilities, and the set is no exception, right? A very common oversight that many developers make is not taking full advantage of the unique methods and APIs that are already offered in Java, which come out of the box. Of course, you can write working code without knowing all of the methods, but these methods can simplify your code and just make it more efficient. So the moral of the story is, take some time to familiarize yourself with the methods provided by the set interface. I've seen a lot of code that resorts to looping and streams and iterations, which are sometimes unnecessary. Right? You can use methods like retain all, remove all, and add all, which can reduce a lot of these complex operations to a single line. Right? Using these built-in methods not only makes your code more concise, improves readability, makes it easy to maintain, and often these built-in methods are optimized for performance. So there is no reason to not use them if they fit your use case. So dive into those API docs and kind of start harnessing the power of the SDK that's already available to us. There you have it. We've navigated through some common yet critical mistakes. And these are mistakes that can trip up sometimes even the most seasoned Java developers, right? We've talked about overlooking the unique strengths of different set implementations to the nuances of handling mutable objects and uh, the subtleties of hash code and equals and the impact of size, set sizes on performance. We've covered a lot today. What other set-related issues have you encountered and how have you resolved them? Is there any common mistake that you have encountered that I haven't covered? Let me know in the comments if there's anything that I've missed. And also, go watch this video. It'll blow your mind.